Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. So much more to St. Louis than the arts. Being able to make a difference here, I believe will help make a difference everywhere. Take a breath and really celebrate the moment. Today on Spotlight, honoring the beauty of the teapot, why some of these are not what they seem. Plus, a personal and scientific study about heartbreak, how it affects your body and what to do to help yourself. And then a WashU researcher fights against a deadly brain tumor to give patients hope. But first, a tour of St. Louis's most beautiful and significant architecture. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. St. Louis architecture is so much, it is so varied. Well, the arch is super important because it is such a simplistic symbol of the birth of our country, right? And so, and architecturally, it's incredible because it was designed about 25 years before people think it was, right? Like it looks like it was, it was built in the 1960s, but it was designed in the 1940s. So it was very forward thinking at the time, um, which makes it incredibly significant. So much more to St. Louis than the arch. So when looking at St. Louis architecture, it's kind of great to think about the idea that we just kind of pulled our city out of the ground, right? The clay for the brick, the limestone for the foundations, and the people that came here from all over the world to build our city. So this is the Wainwright Building by Louis Sullivan, one of the most important architects in American architectural history, and it's his most important building, and it's considered the first skyscraper. When we talk about the Wainwright Building and we say it's the first skyscraper, usually someone laughs because they're like, there's no way. And yes, it was not the first tall building, and it's not the tallest building of its time, at the, even of the 1890s. Um, but what it's different and what makes it the first skyscraper is it's the first building to look tall. It articulates its height, is how we say it. You know, the form that Louis Sullivan came up with could be stretched another 80 stories, right, and be the same form. And that was really radically different. What's also significant about the building is its use of St. Louis materials, right? Red terracotta, the, they're using the material that you see everywhere in the red bricks, you know, all throughout St. Louis. And so it's really symbolic of that. And even though it has a lot of carvings and some really great detailing on it, um, it is definitely leaning towards modern and it has much less detailing than other buildings of its time would have had. So this is the old post office and it was built, it was actually designed in the 1870s, right after the Civil War. The federal government built several of these around the country um, as a kind of a show of might, right? They, they put these big federal buildings in, in lots of big cities like Philadelphia and New York. Um, of those six that they built, only two, like this is the only one that's left. So it's really significant, not just locally, but nationally. The guy that designed it, his name is Alfred Mullet, and he was working for the U.S. government, and he designed these buildings. And there are only two examples of his work in this style left. One is the executive building in Washington, D.C., and this one. And so it's really, really significant. It's actually listed in one of the top 10 most significant buildings in the country. And they started excavating to put this building on the site. Not too far down, they actually ran into a big uh, area of quicksand. And they had to adjust for that. And so the way they did that is they sunk over 4,000 pine logs into the quicksand to get a firm thing, poured concrete on top of that, and the building has not settled or moved since. So we're at the Soulard Market, one of the most famous places in St. Louis. Everybody hears about it, but it's not a building that a lot of people know about. The actual history of it, how it got to be here, um, and it's a building with a huge history. This land was donated to the city of St. Louis by Julia Soulard, who owned this land. She donated it with the caveat that it will always be a public market, which is why St. Louis has a public market still, all these years later. And it's considered one of the oldest farmer's markets west of the Mississippi. Well, the original was just a bunch of people with horse carts. And then there were, you know, kind of a, a more ramshackle type uh, structure. Also, the site that it's on, this was hit by a tornado in 1896. An F4 tornado swept through here doing massive damage. 
flattened the market, and the building that we have now was the building that was rebuilt after the you know after that tornado. 90% of Soulard is that great St. Louis red brick. Um, and while I'm not quite sure where this brick comes from, it is interesting how it sits within the neighborhood and they use yellow brick, yellows and browns. So it does kind of set itself apart from the red brick of the neighborhood. So we're over here in kind of a residential area of Soulard. I mean, everybody connects Soulard to the market, and, but it's actually a great place to see some of the earliest examples of architecture in St. Louis that we still have left behind from those early people that came here. One of the great things about architecture in Soulard and seeing these homes is to think about what happened inside of them. I mean, these things, the buildings behind me predate the Civil War. So to think that, you know, all the changes our country went through, people were inside them talking about those changes, right? They were experiencing life and all the changes we've seen in the modern era all happened within these walls. So most of the people in Soulard would have lived in multi-family homes, like the ones behind me. There would have been several families living in different apartments, they're called flats. Um, some of them would have been, a, um, you would access it from the front, and then the other apartments you would access actually through something called a mouse hole. And this is a mouse hole. And this would have given the inhabitants of the building access to the backyard and to the upper floor apartments. And so I love to encourage people to just walk the neighborhoods, even if it's not your neighborhood, you know, walk it, look at the buildings, and think about the people that came, the people that built them. You know, we have so many buildings built by hand and look at the, the legacy left behind by those artisans. Don't forget to look up in your own city. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We are in the art gallery at Craft Alliance. We're in the middle of our exhibition, which just opened, called Reflection Tea. It's the 18th iteration of our teapot biennial, which has been, if you do the math, going on for more than three decades. And as always, we have a really exciting group of artists who are presenting their art in the form of the teapot. So the exhibition was curated by Fang Chu. He is an artist himself who works in ceramics. And what's really exciting about the artists that he has chosen is they have a broad, broad reach and a range of artistic practices. They are international. We've received works from overseas in some cases, and they are from all over the United States. It's really interesting to see this variety of artists, and it's a real great mix of all of the traditions and different kinds of approaches to ceramic art and to teapots in particular. One of the fun things about this exhibition is it's a great demonstration of a ceramic tradition of trompe l'oeil, so making ceramic look like it's a completely different material. And we have lots of people who have worked in this tradition, so you have teapots that look like they're made out of wood or metal or fabric, lots of other materials. So it's a fun exhibition in that way. The exhibition is called Reflection Tea because this is really a great moment for reflection. I know it's been a chaotic and stressful past two years for everyone. So this exhibition offers the opportunity to slow down a bit and to enjoy the moment. One of the special things about this exhibition is that all the artists who participated presented us with a tea story. So a story of what tea and teapots have meant in their lives and of tea making. And sometimes that's a more formal ritual and sometimes that's a more casual gathering with friends. So it's really a moment to think about the story of tea in your life and to look at these objects as you consider what it means to live in the moment and what it means to pause your day and really enjoy either your time alone, your time with friends, and to take a breath and really celebrate the moment. Reflection Tea is on view at the Craft Alliance until March 25th. We'll be having a closing reception on March 18th. And for more information about the exhibition, you can go to our website at craftalliance.org. HEC Media. Recognized. Celebrated. Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Find all of the award-winning content 
at hcmedia.org. Florence Williams isn't fragile. She's taken on tough rivers by herself, and she knows where to go for the best breathtaking views. But when Williams realized one day that her 25-year marriage was ending, the emotions that hit her felt like unfamiliar territory. Disbelief, grief, loneliness. These are the hallmarks of a broken heart. In Heartbreak, a personal and scientific journey, Williams probes the pain that took over her mind, body, and soul as she struggled to understand why losing someone you love feels so bad. That's because feeling alone and rejected literally changes our cells and our immune systems. But Williams also discovered that heartbreak doesn't have to break us. In fact, if we can open ourselves to the beauty of the world around us, we can gain something new. You start this story uh, in the outdoors, which is such a huge integral part of your life on a river trip that becomes sort of a metaphor <laughs> for so many of the things you're experiencing at that time. Yes, and you know, I had written a book before this one called The Nature Fix, in which I was really looking at the science behind why we feel healthier and happier when we're outside. I could really relate to that. And so I was already primed to try to seek comfort and healing in nature. Uh, and that man manifested itself in some both expected and also unexpected ways. I talked to one psychologist pretty early on and he said, you know, the story of divorce is a story of inflammation. And then I started working with a neurogeneticist at UCLA who had done a lot of research into specifically our white blood cells during times of social stress. Um, for example, in states of loneliness. And what he was finding that was that our, our, gen, our genetic markers really change and they change the way our immune cells fight threats in our environment, depending on whether we feel lonely or not. And so we decided to actually take samples of my own blood and analyze them at various time points after the split. One scientist said to me, you know, heartbreak is one of the hidden landmines of human existence. And if you don't try to recover from it, it will have serious implications for your health. I thought, and okay, wow, I need to tell that story. Yes. And it's the one landmine that you cannot avoid by any other kind of behavior, right? I mean, you, you can't outsmart it. You can't outrun it. You can't outplan it. No, it's, it's just one of those things that happens to most of us, actually, <laughs> sooner or later. And it's not only romantic heartbreak. I mean, there are lots of ways we experience heartbreak. You know, there's bereavement after the death of someone we're attached to. There are the kinds of heartbreaks we suffer when we see our landscape of our home changing. There are the heartbreaks that many of us are experiencing during this pandemic, where we feel cut off from our communities. And then, of course, I also feel like there's a sort of perhaps unspoken heartbreak that many of us experience because we are just disconnected from nature. The foundation, really, of heartbreak is, is the, the healing power of nature and, and discovering that science and how it affects you. But as we all know, there are a lot of people that don't really have access to it. How can you relay this message to, to those People. One, of, one of the central concepts in the book is that beauty can be an antidote to heartbreak, but it doesn't have to be beauty through nature. So there are a lot of ways that we experience beauty. There are a lot of ways that we experience awe, you know, sometimes it may be listening to music, or it may be looking at art, or it may be um, entering a cathedral or finding it through religion. Um, so I, I would just encourage people to um, partake, you know, in, 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 whatever that is that creates a sense of um, beauty in your life and a sense of connection through awe. To find out why she thinks divorce helped her find even more love in her life, watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. Bringing young people together with art, later on Spotlight. Glioblastoma is the most aggressive brain tumor. It's the same tumor that killed Bo Biden, John McCain, Ted Kennedy. And unfortunately, not enough has changed over the last 20 years for its treatment. So most people will uh, die within two years of being diagnosed. 
Dr. Milan Cheda is a neuro-oncologist and neurologist at Siteman Cancer Center. He wants to be able to offer hope to his patients. Research in his Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis laboratory may one day lead to new therapies for glioblastoma. And the SB28s look good. Yeah, they, they look good. One new discovery was developed from a collaboration between Dr. Cheda's lab and the lab of Dr. Michael Diamond, professor of medicine and professor of molecular microbiology and of pathology and immunology. Diamond previously published extensive research on the Zika virus, a disease that spread to people through mosquito bites. Outbreaks of Zika left many babies with permanent brain damage. The virus has a propensity to infect neuroprogenitor cells in fetuses, and then can cause cell injury to them. Because of that, we had a former postdoc in the laboratory who had an idea and said, well, if it can infect progenitor cells that are functioning normally, what about tumor stem cells in the brain that sort of look like progenitor cells? They're a little different, they're tumor cells, but they share some features with them. And so what he showed was that Zika virus could infect and kill tumor stem cells that are glioblastoma tumor stem cells. When we injected it directly into growing tumors in mice, we found that these mice could survive long-term. Further research showed how Zika virus might also be a key to unlocking the power of immunotherapy for glioblastoma. In lab mice, Zika activated immune cells to destroy the deadly brain tumor. First of all, we made it in a more attenuated version that's safer because, you know, there's some concerns about putting viruses in the brains of immunocompromised people. So we engineered a way that the virus is not nearly as potent as it normally is, but still can kill all of these stem cells. And then we showed mechanistically that the major way that the virus works is actually to reawaken the immune response because the combination of the virus and the tumor provoke a CD8 T cell response, and it's the CD8 T cell response that then clears the rest of the tumor away. The groundbreaking findings may lead to human clinical trials for this targeted therapy, giving a powerful boost to an immunotherapy drug. The idea would be the first treatment for glioblastoma is usually a surgical resection. Now we can combine Zika virus with immunotherapy at the time, uh, at right after the tumor is removed by surgery. There's even more groundbreaking research that can lead to clinical trials for therapies from another collaboration on campus. Professor of Medicine and Genetics, Dr. Li Ding and her team mapped glioblastoma. It's part of the Human Tumor Atlas Network, a large scale effort to understand the lifespan of tumors. Single cell sequencing of glioblastoma and the tumor's microenvironment led to the creation of 3D maps of the tumor ecosystem. Then the scientists analyze how the maps change over time, giving them valuable insights about the deadly tumor. What this study shows is that not all glioblastomas are the same, and they're not going to respond in the same way to therapies. The findings will help match glioblastoma patients to experimental treatments for best patient outcomes. So really mapping the tumor at a deeper level helps stratify patients for clinical trial. So really what we need are quick testable biomarkers that says if you have this result, then you go into this bin. And then our other work is developing new treatments to target and kill treatment resistant cells, trying to identify what makes cells within a specific patient different than other cells in that same patient. The clinical trials, treatments, and research are under one umbrella, boosting collaborations. Washington University School of Medicine and Barnes Jewish Hospital established the Brain Tumor Center dedicated to benign and malignant tumors. For more information, go to our website, hecmedia.org. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. 
Hi, I'm Lauren Ross. I'm the executive director of Laumeier Sculpture Park, and this is an exhibition that I co-curated with Laumeier's curator, Dana Turkovich, entitled Salutary Sculpture. This exhibition brings together eight artists who are exploring themes of healing and uh, recovery and health and wellness through their work. Many of them actually came to their current artistic practices through their own personal journeys of, of recovering from illness and injury. Hi, my name is Tom Condon. My work is born out of two kind of big physical traumas that I went through in my life. Uh, Early on, around eighth grade, I had a physical condition called idiopathic pseudotumor cerebris, which resulted in my body making too much cerebral fluid. Uh, it built up so much that it ended up pinching off my optical nerves and me slowly losing my eyesight. Ultimately, I ended up getting my eyesight back, but when it did come back, there had been so much pressure on my optical nerves that it resulted in a lot of scarring. So a lot of the forms in my work resemble figures. You might think that you know one looks like a bird's head or another one looks like a, a horse. I try to keep the figures in a place that they are ambiguous enough to where they can kind of shift from one uh, identification to another depending upon who's looking at them. Hi, I'm James Sterling Pitt. I archive all my memories and thoughts through drawing and then as I enter the studio I pick an object that I want to be three-dimensional in the world. So this process originated in July of 2007 when I was in a car accident that left me neurologically and physically disabled. So part of dealing with a brain injury has been that I have to trust kind of my dream world as much as I trust my waking world or my observations because your brain is giving you information very differently than kind of in a linear way. My name is Hope Ginsberg, and the work I'm showing in Salutary Sculpture is from a series of 15 land dive team projects uh, made starting in 2014. And each piece situates a solo or group of scuba divers meditating in a landscape that can be interpreted environmentally, such as um, at the edge of a tide that's rising, which evokes sea level rise, or in a desert where perhaps the sea is encroaching. I learned to dive so that I could see sea sponges, which were a muse in my practice for many, many years. And when I learned to dive, it was not long after I had some injuries to my sternum and to my spine. And so moving with the tank on my back on land, floating with the tank on my back in water, kind of torquing my spine, really signaled to me that healing had taken place. If there's one thing that I would like for visitors to take away, it's, it's the idea that self-care and community care are incredibly important things and go hand in hand. And you know, this is, as I mentioned before, really a, a sort of moment when the need for self-care is so high, but it's also a moment where our communal care for each other is exceptionally high as well. On display at Laumeier Sculpture Park through May 15th. Visit laumeiersculpturepark.org for more info. This story is brought to you in partnership with STL Made. <laughs>like making music, if you want to make the world a better place, if you're an artist, if you're a painter, if you're a poet, if you're a dancer, we have something for you. We have something that you can belong to. We're a non-profit anti-gun violence organization that's geared towards helping impo impoverished groups in between the ages of 16 and 24. We help them to mold and sharpen their gifts and talents through the arts. And we focus on gun violence, but we try to do it in a way that uplifts our community. I was awakened in 2012 to gun violence and the epidemic that it is when two sisters in University City who were just sitting on their own front porch were shot in a drive-by. And I wanted to think about how to make the gun violence visible and how to create change. The youth program is at the center of Story Stitchers. That's why we love what we do, because they are so hungry to learn and hungry to have a chance at living healthy, normal lives. Just showing the youth 
that they have value, that we value them, their time, their talent, and their efforts is a big way that we help them to open up. What they need are opportunities that they didn't know existed. You can't attempt to achieve something if you don't know that, it, that it's an option for you. We've grown and evolved and learned how to use other medias such as podcasts to get messages out there. And, and the messages themselves, by the way, are, are stories from, from our own lives and, and stories that we collect from people that have gone through things, you know? And we, we put those in songs, we put those in podcasts to amplify those voices so that they're heard. This is Stitchcast Studio, produced by St. Louis Story Stitchers in St. Louis, Missouri. The podcast, like the sex ed one especially, and the trauma one, were podcasts that they came up with on their own. Like, it wasn't like, okay, we're going to talk about this. It was like, no, what do you all want to talk about? And they were like, trauma, mental health, sex education. We need to know more about it. I think it's powerful that we are aware of what we need, and we're reaching out, you know, and that Story Stitchers is able to provide the support to answer these questions and have these conversations, like a safe space especially, and to get the youth comfortable enough to not only have this conversation, but publish it and let the world hear it. So let's get to it. We ready, we ready, we ready for the best to start. What they're saying is important and we need to listen to them because they're living this agony that our whole city's going through. You know, last year we had the worst gun violence we've had in 50 years. And these young people live in these neighborhoods and they're trying hard to help us understand what it is we can do to help them. The biggest thing we can do is invest in these youth in this city. And I do think things will turn around if we do that. In the future for Story Stitchers, I just wanna see, you know, generations of leaders you know I don't want it to just stop with me and Brandon or everyone else who's like in this circle right now who've come up in this generation like I want to see more youth like you know take the baton and like just dash off with it even if they run faster than we do like that's even better I want to see story stitches to continue to be a pillar in the communities in the St. Louis region if we become something that is replicable all over the nation, then so be it, you know, but it always starts at home. So just us being able to make a difference here, I believe will help make a difference everywhere. Visit thestl.com for more stories like this one. Next week, how local theaters are overcoming the hardships of the pandemic. Plus, the World Chess Hall of Fame celebrates 10 years. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.